If you love classic contemporary Christian music and the people that made it, please like this video and subscribe to our channel to help support us and keep us going. This is Stage Right, and I am your host, John Thorne. They say if you die with a handful of friends, you die a rich man. Well, I have several buses full, and I'm very excited to share them all with you. Welcome to Stage Right. I am your host, John Thorne, and I appreciate you tuning in today for episode six. Um, after four weeks, we are already having daily downloads from all over the world. It's kind of crazy that the whole internet thing allows you to do that, but it's been fun. I've heard from people from South Africa, from South America. It's kind of crazy. If you want to email the show, you can actually email me at john at stagerightpodcast.com john at stagerightpodcast.com if you want to reach out with the holidays coming up i'm thinking about doing a kind of a ccm bundle christmas package kind of thing instead of asking people for money or support for the podcast i thought maybe i'd put together a package and uh, john schlitt and billy smiley and some different people have already said that they would throw in some stuff so i might be doing that we'll keep you posted on that but here's a word from our sponsor Hey Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services to generate more leads, more exposure, and more revenue for your business or organization. Let Hey Rockstar amplify your awesomeness. One of my best and uh, funniest friends ever. I love Jay. Jay, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you doing, my friend? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. All right, so you're from Florida. I just want to dive in. I am from Florida. I was born in New Jersey, but I, I left there when I was three, so that technically doesn't count, although sometimes if you tell someone that in Tennessee, they'll go, you're from where? <laughs> right. Not in a bad way, but just in a New Jersey, you don't sound like I said, no, I, I left there when I was three, so you don't really have a big accent you pick up when you're when you're um, <laughs> at that age, but no, yes, I am from Florida. That's correct. You got out of New Jersey before you got the accent and the attitude. Apparently, well, I, I'm sure I've got some attitude, but uh, uh, but yes, I, I did leave. I left New Jersey at a at a younger age. That's right. So you are from Florida. Did you grow up in church? Yeah, sort of, but close enough. I mean, uh, we didn't. I went to a, uh, a a Christian school from kindergarten through eighth grade. And the reason we went there is because the school I was zoned for, which was literally two blocks from our house, and you could walk to it. And even even a kid that age, it, back then you could walk to school. You weren't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a thing. Um, but they, the year I was supposed to start, they said for the next I think two or three years, we're going to ship you across town about thirty minutes to go to another school. <laughs> and, and that was the whole busing thing. And um, and, and my parents never – it wasn't a problem with, oh, you're going to go to this school in this area that was bad. It was just a uh, – we, we could walk to school versus you're going to ride on a bus an hour round trip each day to go to so, – so they said, no, we're not going to do that. And, and they enrolled me in a, in a Christian school, and um, our home wasn't particularly religious. So there was never anything uh, – uh, adversarial toward it but that that wasn't that wasn't really our our thing um right right uh and you know i, I was the kid that every year you know you go to church or sunday school I was like no nah, i didn't go this week and it never went any week you know and it's uh, um but i but i went there and it was uh a good school great school and a lot a lot of foundational things both in terms of 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 doctrinal things you know because it was like i said it was a christian school and and just being around that kind of culture where it was you had a you had a good it was a Lutheran school but you had a balance of of you know grace and the letter of the law you know because one without the other is is um, one without the other is a problem either way so that laid a foundation for you is that when you got exposed to Christian music uh, yes and no, not really it was more it was more in in uh, high school uh, we started my parents got divorced when I was in about seventh grade and um, mom got remarried and we ended up started going to a a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. And that's where I got introduced to, to Christian music, CCM music. 
right. um, in, in, in the ninth grade. Oh, that's cool. And in, and that was the mid eighties. So in the mid eighties, if you, if you were into CCM music and, and, you know, went to church and youth group, I mean, there were several bands that you were, you were into. I mean, everybody, everybody was into Michael W. Smith. Everybody was into Amy Grant. Um, everybody was into, uh, you know, DeGarmo and Key and Whiteheart. And, and the big one was, was Petra. Right. Okay, Jay. So youth group was big for you, and that's where you were exposed to a lot of CCM. Tell everyone your journey from youth group in Florida to Nashville and ultimately Petra. That's, that's, that's a fun story. Um, like I said, if you, were into, if you were into Christian music and into, into, into that stuff in the, in the 80s, um, Petra was a was a huge band, and at the time it was interesting. Uh, I, remember, I remember our pastor coming into our lead pastor coming into uh, youth group or youth choir or whatever one one night. He's like, and he comes in, hey, uh, I met some guys today that you I know you're going to be interested in. We're going, ah, who'd you meet? Whatever. Uh, we met John Schlitt and Bob Hartman, and we're going, <laughs> how how is this possible? <laughs> what happened? And he proceeded to tell us how he and a bunch of pastors were invited to this thing. Um, cause you know, there was a Petra concert coming up, you know, in, in a couple months. Right. And it's funny when, with that, when I talked to John, when I started working for them, they said, you know, in, in the eighties going out and doing your promotional tour, wasn't like it is now where you go to radio stations and talk, you weren't going to promote your record. You were going, they had to go out and try to recruit people to come to the concert. Yeah. Try, they had to talk to pastors and churches and say, Hey, this is what we're doing it's okay for your kids to come to the concert. It's not, it's not, uh, I mean, that, that they were selling the entire product of Christian music, of Christian rock and roll, of, of playing right. the world's music. And, and that sounds crazy now, but that's what they were doing. So it's funny how that story, of course, aligns with John's story on the same thing, which, you know, means it happened and it was great. But, but yeah, so that was, that was that. And we went to, I mean, we went to all kinds of stuff, but I probably in high school I probably went to, oh gosh, at least ten Petra concerts. Oh, wow. you know, they, they'd come a couple times a year. They'd come to a festival, or whatever, and 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 we went, and it was just like this, 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 this is this is the night. This is going to be a great night because this is our favorite band, and and uh, you know, and, and they were a great artist. They put on great shows and and did what they did. Right. Okay, so ultimately you went from youth group, your pastor met, met those guys, kind of auditioned for the band, kind of auditioned for the pastor to get his approval to send his kids there. So you go to 10 Petra concerts, you're a fan. When did you decide you were going to move to Nashville? And then ultimately, how did that lead to you ending up on the road with Petra? Yeah, you know, I moved to Nashville in 1991 and enrolled at Belmont University. But what got me going there was there were two guys in our church who had I, they were several years older than me, um, but I several, I mean, probably four or five years older or seven or eight years older, but uh, it was Bo and Todd Cooper. They're, you know, brothers that are, that are incredibly talented that are still in Nashville. I know Bo and Todd. I'd never met them, but I'd heard of them. And when I was in about 11th grade, I think or so, uh, the, our, our youth pastor and youth music pastor said, Hey Jay, you got these two guys are coming in town. They're, they're Christian musicians. They're doing CCM music in Nashville and we need to introduce you to them. So I, I was introduced to them, and they were they were awesome. They were very hospitable and listened to whatever ramblings a 16 year old kid had to say. And um, and we became friends and got to uh, see them on the Michael W. Smith uh, Go West tour in '91. I was out invited out to to that as as a guest of them. So I was probably 19, 20 by then. Right. And they encouraged me to come and visit Nashville. Oh wow! So about a year later, I ended up. Uh, moving to Nashville and uh, lived with Bo Cooper for uh, you know probably three or four months. I think there was someone he was rooming with who was out on the road and I sublet, whatever. And, you know, the Bo and Todd introduced me to lots of people and, and helped me get my first gig and all kinds of stuff like that. But it was, uh, and, and they always introduced me as, hey, this is our friend from Florida. Right. And in reality, I hadn't really met them until after they'd moved away. And, and but again, very, uh, two people that I will always be incredibly appreciative of. Pretty much a story that all of us have. I think we do. There was always someone in, in our lives that, that kind of brought us along and included us in what they were doing. Yes, and and included us as in, hey, this person's a guest at my table, right. so they're cool. I'm cool with them, so 
everybody else was cool with me because they, they you know, it, it, that's how that worked. And it was, it's how it worked. It's just everybody. If you walked in with someone, everyone there thought you belonged with everybody. Yes. And, and that's how that worked. And, and, and it probably still does. I don't, I don't, of course I don't, I don't run with a bunch of 20, 19 year old musicians that are, are just moving to town, but, but that's how that, that's how that worked. And it was, it was a cool little, um, I don't say it was a fraternity, like you had to know the secret handshake to get in, but it was just a, once you were in, you were accepted as this guy belongs here. He's a pro. He's absolutely. And it didn't matter if you both played the same instrument. Most people who moved to Nashville, wherever they've come from, they were usually the best musician or one of the best musicians in their, in their crowd they ran with. And it, it's no different than when you, when you're the, when you, when you go play college football, you were probably the top guy in your high school team or one of them. And then you get there and you realize, wow, there's a lot of guys who are really good. Right. But with very few exceptions, most of that was never <laughs> a, oh, I'm better than this guy. It was just a mutual respect thing. It was. Even if it was guys playing the same instruments who in theory were, you know, battling or looking, looking for fighting over the same gigs. Fighting is a strong word, but you, you know what I mean? Well, if somebody had a gig, you knew they could play. If you met someone that worked at the cooker trying to get a gig, then it might have been a different story. But anyone that had a gig it had instant credibility. That's correct, because there are there are more players, more quality players than there are gigs available. Yes. And um, like any of this stuff where there's a, a, a surplus of, I'll use economic terms, a surplus of labor and a shortage of, of, of opportunity, right. uh, you're not going to have people doing gigs for the most part that aren't good. Cause as, as Herm Edwards says, the NFL coach, <laughs> actually he's a college coach now, the NFL ESPN commentator says, if, if, if you don't belong there, the gig will find you out. Right. It'll usher you along the way to, to, to not being there because you, you that's just how it goes. I've never been to a crummy restaurant in New York city because right. there's no market for that. <laughs> right. Well, that brings up a whole nother discussion. There shouldn't be a market for bad restaurants anywhere, but let's move on. Okay, so do you remember when we met? Well, we sort of met in, 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 in 1998 when Truth came to my church, but we didn't really meet. I just saw them, and, and I know you were with them, but we didn't meet then. Um, you, you're going to have to help me out when we first met. You said 98, but it was 88. 88. Did I say 98? Excuse me. I'm in 88. The time that I remember officially meeting you was getting ready for the Saltbox tour. Which would have been the beginning of 96. Yes. Like January, February of 96. Yes. I remember when it was. I, okay. I remember it's when you, you, you filled in for Ronnie on bass because his wife was having a baby and he had to miss a gig. It was the first night of the tour and you know, you were with Whiteheart, so that was just a natural fit, but you sat in on bass for right. one or two nights. It was just the first night of the tour. Okay, that, that's where I would have met you then. Yep. And that day, we were in Gainesville, Georgia, and the reason I remember that is I had a friend in Gainesville, Florida, that was waiting for me to call him to tell him what time the show started. And I just saw Gainesville and didn't pay attention. <laughs> and I had to call him and say, dude, uh, I'm in Georgia. I'm not in Florida tonight, so. <laughs> You're gonna... We're like seven hours from you, but it's 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 the same name. It's just the the suffix is different, so we're nowhere near you. Exactly. So I hadn't paid attention whatsoever. So we met. We did three tours basically together. We did the Saltbox tour, then we did uh, the John Schlitz solo tour, Unfit for Swine. Which the the first one was spring of '96, and that was Petra and Whiteheart. Yep. And then the the, the second, the Schlitt tour, was. The fall of 96. Yep. And then the third tour we did was actually the, the whole year of 1997, the Petra Praise 2 tour. Yes. Pet, yes. We did. I think we probably did close to 100 dates on that one. It was, it was, and, and we did, uh, I know we did some South America. We did some Europe. Yep. Um, and it was, uh, it was a good time. Yes. It was all over the world and elsewhere. It really was. Right on. Well, dude, I know our conversations usually go about six hours, so we're going to end up with a bonus episode. We're going to end up with part two and three. But before I move on, I want you to tell everyone that's listening who you toured with, who you worked with in music. Oh, gosh, several, several artists, several great artists, many great artists. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, we've discussed, of course, is, is Petra. I was with them from 95 to 
99 and a little bit of 2000 that was that was one of the, the main ones i toured with sure and the and the one the and it's the one that got me i think almost in fact i think every stamp in my passport <laughs> um I, i've been to i've been fortunate i've been to 20 i think i think it's 27 countries i'd have to look 27 countries 49 states and and five continents but uh, petra was the one that that got me i think like, like I said, literally every stamp in that in that passport. That's awesome. Uh, in addition to them, there were a handful of others. Uh, Patty Loveless, a country artist, very nice, very nice woman, wonderful singer. Uh, did a couple tours with her right after. Well, it wasn't right after Petra. Right after Petra, I got off the road. Then I got sucked back into touring. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did did some dates with Lone Star for a couple of years. Another country artist, uh, nice nice guys. Cool. And um, a handful of other uh, CCM artists. Everybody. I mean, I, I did shows from with people from everybody from, you know, Michael W to DC Talk and uh, Jackie Velasquez. People like that. Just uh, wonderful. Like I said, wonderful artists that that um, you get you get to work with and, and great people on the road. And and uh, for him was another one. That I forgot. Why I forget about that. Wow. We did a 2003 tour. Dude, you did a for him tour? I did. It was it was in 2003, and it was a uh, World Vision was the sponsor of it, but it was for him was the headliner. It was a multi artist thing, and uh, we had a house band, and I was the MD on the gig. And I'll tell a quick story about that just because uh, because I can. For people that don't aren't part of the music industry, I'll explain this real quick. When you when you're putting a, a tour together, the band typically gets together unless the band is the artist i mean like like a band like u2 is is the is the artist in the band but if it's a band backing a group like i'm talking about here with for him or an artist uh, a singer a solo artist typically the band will get together for for rehearsals prior to the artist coming in sometimes the artist is, is involved all the time but they'll typically the band will get get together before that way when the artist comes in it's, they've already gone over stuff and and there's always arrangements and things to be tweaked, but but they're not coming in. Hey, we haven't heard these songs before yet. So the first day we come in, we we did we done about a week's worth of rehearsals, and the first day we come in at uh, rehearsal hall, and the the four four him guys come in, and <laughs> I'd spoken with a couple of them on the phone, but we we met for the first time, and, and the first thing they did after you know uh, introducing themselves to the the band and the the crew guys and everyone in the room, they one by one they they walked over to the monitor console. Each person on stage gets gets their own mix, so they 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 decide what they want in their mix, and they tell the monitor engineer. So you walk, these guys all walk over them, and they just start dialing in their mix. You know, the, the band's playing. Okay, I want some more drums, more guitars, and mm-hmm. you know, Mark went over and did that. And a couple minutes later, Andy went over, and then then Kirk, and then and Marty, and they they all kind of just did that. And um, it was really cool. You're just going these these are just seasoned pro guys that that know what they want, know what things uh, what things what things they want to sound like in their ears. Right. And those guys were wonder wonderful people and wonderful singers. And you know, I know they've been you know won multiple Dove awards and you know group of the year, vocal group of the year, all that kind of stuff. But they they, they genuinely are. Uh, you know, you get four those four guys on a stage and they're they're, they're singing. They're, they're they're awesome. So it was uh it was fun. We did we did that tour. So that was uh that was another one that was really uh, an enjoyable experience. Cool. One of the things Kirk and I talked about in uh, preparing for the show, we were we had a conversation the other day. It lasted about three hours. Oh wow! And tell me I, when that airs because I'd love to hear it. That'd be exciting to hear. It's going to be the week after you. You're this Thursday and Kirk's next Thursday. Okay. So in the conversation we had, one of the things Kirk brought up is how many concerts for him did together in truth before they actually were for him. Oh, I bet they did. I bet they did hundreds. Well, I'm not going to give the number because Kirk and I will talk about it. You have to listen. Okay. He will give the answer of how many concerts they sang together before they left the truth bus and went out as for him. It's remarkable. How many years were they were they part of the the truth uh, entourage, if you will? <laughs> well, Mark was there in '86. Kirk had been there in the early '80s, but then came back in August of '87. I believe Andy and Marty both joined the summer of '87, and then their first album came out in 1990. So I'm guessing around three to three and a half years. I will tell you, uh, they're fabulous guys and great singers and unique. Every one of them's got a really unique voice, but man, they blend so well together. They do. That, that's what's funny because when you when you think, oh, they must all have the same kind of thing, that they, they really don't. Absolutely, four completely different voices. 
Yeah, that's right. They are very different singers. And I think most of the groups that you would think of as being vocal groups where there's multiple singers are, it's the same case with, with lots of those, because if you have five people that sound exactly the same, you really don't need the other four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but that was one of the, that was one of the, uh, it wasn't the last tour I did, but it was one of the last tours I did. It was, I guess it was in 2003 and, uh, it was really a good time. I enjoyed it a lot and it was, it was good music and, and, and I'm, I'm glad I had an opportunity to do that. Dude, I'm glad you had a chance to do that too. They're great guys. All right. So you have a story, Jay, that involves five very famous people, one being a very famous bass player. So tell everyone your story within a story that involves Nathan East, the bass player, and four other guys. Uh, Nathan East. Nathan East is a world-class bass player, and by a world-class bass player, I mean, if you talk to a bass player, of which I'm talking to one right now, <laughs> any of them would tell you, top 10 bassists out there, Nathan East is going to be on the list. Yep. And if you're not a, a music person like that that knows the, the behind-the-scenes type guys, the, the studio players, if you go to allmusic.com and look it up, he's probably going to have 10 pages. And when you start looking down the, the song titles and the artists, every one of them is going to be songs you know. Yep. Back in the early 2000s, I got connected with Yamaha and did several live events with them with house bands and multi-artist shows and, and some of the just, just wonderful artists, wonderful musicians. And then they were just, again, world-class artists. And, and the musicians were guys like uh, Steve Gadd and John Robinson, the Picaros and Tim Akers and, and the Nashville horn sections, Tower of Power horn section, just amazing musicians. And Nathan East was on one of these gigs we're doing in, in, in L.A., out in Anaheim. Right. And the, you know, the, the rig rolls in and they're dumping the truck and they pull the uh, case cover off of his 410 cabinet and he's got two laminated set lists on the top of it. <laughs> one of them is one of them is Eric Clapton. The other one's Phil Collins. <laughs> Again, artists with decades long careers and, and you know, the, the best of the best. Right. You know, you, you meet this guy and super nice guy. So first night we're done with the rehearsals. We were there for two or three nights and did the show, and everybody goes home. The two guys that were on the gig that were front of house and monitor engineer were Chris Taylor and Randy Weitzel. I think you know those guys, but yep. I met them on a Michael W. tour, and they'd been out with Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, and they had both gotten off the road and were working for Yamaha. And I'm walking through the hotel lobby and look in the bar and the restaurant, and my, my friend Randy's sitting in there with somebody at his table. And he motions, hey, come on in, come on in. So I come on in and sit down, and it's – Randy, myself, and and Nathan East. <laughs> so I sit down and they invite me to sit down, and we end up sitting there talk till about one in the morning, probably for for an hour and a half, two hours, and I'm just listening to all their stories. They got all these great stories right. from every world class artist they've worked for. Some funny stories, some crazy stories, but mostly just great stories of people being awesome. Right. So I just kind of sat there and listened because I'm going, okay, all these stories are better than mine. I'm just going, I'm just going to enjoy this and, and get a front row seat in some really cool rock and roll history here and right. and uh, a, a lot a lot of miles. And so finally, he so he asked me, so so who have you played with? What do you do? That was when I'd quit touring the first time. And I got off the road a couple years earlier with Petra. So I told him, I said, I was out with a Christian group called Petra. And he, he knew who that was. And it was, it, it's one of those perfect examples of the guys who are the best are not there bragging about what they do. They're interested in what you're doing too. Always. And, and Randy says, you, you got to tell him your story. <laughs> and, and, and as soon as he said that, I knew, I, I've had people say that before. And, and you go, <laughs> What story? And you, and you sound like a bonehead when you tell it because you mean, what do, we, what do, we, what do you mean, what story? Everybody knows what story it is. <laughs> if you know Jay, you know the story he's talking about. In 2001, U2 did the Elevation Tour. And that was, was the same year as, as 9 11, of course. And in, in January 2002 was when they played the Super Bowl, which we all saw that was, I think, still the greatest Super Bowl halftime show ever. Absolutely. So I went to a couple of shows. And I'm I'm a I'm a big fan. I'll be the first to admit I'm a big fan of, of of the band. And in November they were in St. Louis, and I went out there with with a buddy, and we actually met up with a buddy who was living in St. Louis at the time. And we were on the floor right at the tip of the heart at the end of the essentially auxiliary stage, which was just a, a, a essentially a ring around the like a just giant giant ramp. Yeah, shaped like a heart, and it was red, and and that was part of the the branding for the tour. Right. And Bono and Edge come out there, and I held up a sign asking to play with them, <laughs> which is absurd. 
uh, in and of itself, but they'd done this a couple times in that tour. They'd done it a couple times and by a couple times, I mean, you know, maybe half a dozen. Right. Uh, they'd done that back on the, on the, the Joshua tree tour in, in 1987, they'd pulled a fan out of this, out of the crowd to, to play along with a song. And your party is going, ah, this guy's probably a plant or someone they've, they've, they've screened or something. You never know. <laughs> Dude, I know you well enough to know you were putting the conspiracy theory of the planted keyboard player in the crowd to the test. All of them were actually guitar players. Oh, but but uh, no, I wasn't putting it to test. But that but that's a nice idea. That, that's kind of funny. Um, I just I just thought it'd be something to fun to try to do. So I held up this sign asking to play with them, and uh, they pulled this kid up and give him an acoustic guitar, and they start playing Bob Dylan knocking on heaven's door. Right. And I'm going, wow, this is cool. I mean, I've never been to a concert where they pull some out of the crowd. <laughs> and about half of the first verse, Bono comes back out to the tip of the heart. And I'm, I'm probably five feet from the edge there. And he's, you can tell he's kind of looking in the crowd, where is he? Where is he? <laughs> and, uh, and he finally spots me, points me, and goes, piano player, come up. <sighs> and it was, it was exactly like that moment in A Few Good Men with, you know, the final scene where, where Tom Cruise is pounding Jack Nicholson to get him to admit he ordered the code red. That was, that was the goal of the whole movie right. was to admi- get him to admit this stuff. <laughs> and Cruise's character, while that was the end game had never played out in his mind what he was going to do if he actually achieved it, because it wasn't really a realistic agenda <laughs> because it wasn't really a realistic expectation. It could never happen. <laughs> That's right. So when he said piano player come up, there was this just lull in my head for about two seconds. Oh my goodness, this is actually happening. So I get up there and, and, and then the, the crowd helps me up over the, over the little barrier thing. And first thing he says, he goes, you can do this, right? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, we're in G. So I walk back to the piano back there. It's a CP80, which is a Yamaha. It's actually a stringed piano that uh, came out in the, in the late seventies. And you hear it on like Genesis records and yep. And uh, Keen, the, ba- the the British rock band Keen, made it popular again uh, about 15 years ago. Yep. Lovely instrument. I actually have one in my living room here. <laughs> and why wouldn't you after this story? And start playing. Hit the downbeat on G. I'd, I'd never played this song before. I'm going to walk back here. Okay, it's one, five, two minor, one, five, four. Okay, cool. Got this. <laughs> and I go down there, hit the, hit the downbeat on G, and it's a sour note. It sounds terrible. You can hear the PA. And I'm just, you're just going through my head. I'm going, okay, I'm one of probably five people in this building of 20,000 people that can do this. And this isn't working. What's happening. Right. And, and edge comes over real quick. He goes, ah, oh, Bono told you the wrong key. He goes, we're, we're tuned down half a step. We're in G flat, which if you're a piano player, that's six flats, which is, I guess it's a lot. I mean, but it's, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, but it's, if you think of it in terms of numbers and shapes rather than notes, which is how a lot of the Nashville people think, you know, Nashville number system. It's just, it's just numbers and shapes. <laughs> and a lot of flats. So as soon as Edge comes over and says, oh, we're in G flat, can, can you play in G flat? And he had this look in his face like, this guy's not going to be able to play in G flat. It's six flats. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're good. Start playing. But when you're up there doing that, it's the, 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 the crowd's looking at you like, okay, this is one of our guys up with them. Right. We're, we're cheering for this guy. This is the <laughs> – this is the – this is, you know, Rocky going up against Apollo in the first <laughs> round. Everybody's cheering. And then when you hit the bad note, it's like, oh, this could be bad. And and uh, so, like I said, Edge comes over and helps out. And uh, from then on, it was great. Well, he didn't really help out. All he did was fix Bono's mistake, which was tell you the key. Yeah, which when you get into the perspective, Bono was right. Because if he's playing the song, he's going to play it in G. It just happens to be tuned down half a step. Yeah. Um, so no one was really wrong. It just didn't end up right. <laughs> But uh, so Edge comes over, helps out, and, just, and, and, and then it was fine. And about about a verse or two later, Bono comes in and he goes, all right, piano player, your verse. And everybody drops out, and I took eight bars. Oh, that's great. As you're getting done playing the, the chorus a couple more times before the, song, before the song closes out, you're sitting up there, and it's the same kind of thing, uh, bigger stage, bigger artist, but it's the same kind of thing that I mentioned earlier. You're looking around, you're going – that's Larry Mullen Jr. Right, right. I'm playing with Adam Clayton. <laughs> Edge is standing next to me. My goodness, how on earth is this happening? Yep. What have I done to deserve to get to do this? And uh, it was just an awesome experience. And I've got this lovely picture on my wall in my living room of this where I'm sitting there at this at this CP80 piano 
uh, with Bono standing next to me singing. It's a big, I think it's a 16 by 24 print. It's, it's huge. There was a guy I met, and I'm saying I met, I met him online, and this is this is 20 years ago. It wasn't communication. There was, there was no Facebook. There was no social media. There was just whatever, and, and there was this guy, this photographer guy who had gone to like 40 shows on the tour, big fan and loved going to shows, and and took a camera in with him. Right. So I, I came across this guy's website. So I emailed him and I said, you know, da, 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 da. did you happen to be at the St. Louis show on November? It was something at the end of November. And he said, yeah, I was there. And I was like, okay, can I call you? <laughs> so I called him up and we spoke on the phone. I said, okay, did you get a picture of the guy playing piano on the Dylan number? Oh yeah. I've got a couple great. I said, okay, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> And, and I said, I'd like to buy a print from you. I'd like to buy what he shot all this in film. This was all pre-digital. This is, this was all film cameras. Sure. And I said, I'd love to buy a print from you yeah. of that. I could get a print from you. I don't know how many pictures you have, but whatever you have, I'd, I'd love to, to get a nice large print from that. And, and just let me know what it's going to cost. Right. He's like, yeah, I'll go, yeah, I've got several that are really good. And I said, well, you just, just make your pick, whichever one you think is going to be the best one. And, and you know, well, how, how, how big do you want? I said, how big can I get with what you have? <laughs> Resolution wise. And uh, he's like, ah, 16 by 24. So maybe just 16 by 24. Large print like that. He goes, he goes, it'll look great. I said, okay, what do I owe you? And he goes, ah, it's going to be a couple bucks. So I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to shake me down. Sure. If he'd have said, ah, it's going to be a thousand bucks, I'd have been, I wouldn't have been very happy. But You still would have paid it. I'd have been a thousand bucks lighter and he'd have been a thousand bucks richer. It, 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 it is what it is. And I wasn't going to tell him that. But he said, yeah, uh, this, this lab, it comes from, it's a great lab and blah, blah, blah. He goes, it's going to be about 160 bucks. And I said, that sounds, that sounds completely fair. I said, how about, uh, I said, how about I make it 200 for you just to say thanks and, and appreciate it. Oh, that's really nice. He was a super nice guy. So you know, about two weeks later, this package shows up you know, a flat package from, you know, FedEx, whatever. And I, and it, and it comes, I'm going, Oh, I know what this is. What is this thing going to look like? And I open it up and it's just this beautiful print that is an amazing picture. He had a perfect angle on it and I'm going, my goodness, this is amazing. I, ha I have this now. So I took it to uh, a gallery to get, to get framed. Most of my stuff I take to, you know, someplace local, like a uh, Michael's or Hobby Lobby or something, but this one, you know, I'm going to take this to the really overpriced gallery in green hills which is an expensive uh, area in town here <laughs> and you know the one where you walk in and people right. are bringing in you know old money people are bringing in you know priceless things to get framed that you know you trust them with it yes so i come in i said i've got this thing i need to get framed you've probably done fancier things i said but hopefully this is cool and they open it up and and they all start <laughs> gathering around this thing and they go this is you and it's this wonderful piece i have on my wall above my piano in my living room and back full circle to where this story started I get done telling the story that Randy prompted me to tell, and, and Nathan's sitting across the table, his jaw is on the floor, and this is the guy that played Michael Jackson Dangerous Tours and, and all this <laughs> this stuff, and and he's just looking at me like, you've got to be kidding. So it was a really fun moment, and for about three or four minutes telling the story, I felt like I got to sit at the big kid's table for a while. Right. Dude, that is the best story ever, and I'll never forget when that picture popped up on Facebook once you signed on to Facebook, and created an account one day i logged on and you had posted that as your profile pic that was like oh my god look at jay facebook's an interesting animal it's the one you go to if you want to find out what your friends are doing who are over 25 no one under 25 is in there because their parents took it over about five or six years ago and they go ah, we're not going to be here anymore right and it's, and it's also where you go if you want to see grouchy people being political and nasty but but i've i've Really tried to root most of that stuff out, so I just get to go there and see what you know, see what friends are doing and catch up on things. But I think I still have that same picture. It's either in my profile picture, or it's maybe a used to be profile picture, but it's still up there, and I still get comments on it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. just a cool moment that I get to go. You know what? For five minutes, I got to do something really amazing. Yeah, and 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 I feel very fortunate. Dude, that is awesome. Okay, so I want to throw you a curveball, Jay. I want to get to the good stuff. Let's get to some history and some political science. Yes. The first question I want to ask you, is the, is the United States a true democracy? No, it's not. It, it is a representative republic. And the, the difference being in a true democracy, at, at one extreme, you would have – you wouldn't even have representation. You would have people voting on every single topic coming up, which – 
that doesn't really exist. Right. The way we're set up and the way we function is we elect on a local level, you know, mayor, city council members. At a state level, you've got a governor and you've got uh, members of your state house and state senate. And on a national level, you've got, of course, the president and the uh, members of Congress in the United States House and the United States Senate. Right. And they pass laws. They make decisions that, that, affect, you know, that affect our lives. But they're the ones making policy. And our recourse is we have a choice as to who we send there. You can vote for somebody else. You can vote to recall somebody as an extreme. And the reason the founders gave us a representative republic, as is prescribed in the Constitution, was one of the things that does is protects minority rights. And, and I don't mean minority in the sense of racial or ethnic minorities where, where that term is, is commonly used, although it, it can mean that. It just means that 50 percent plus one – that group does not get to dictate policy for the entire country. Right. And and that's a good thing. Yes, and it was meant to protect everybody. Correct. Okay, so in the spirit of protecting people, Jay, why do you think there are so many people right now that want to erase history? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> wow, where can we go with that one? We can go lots of places with that one. I'll, I'll, start, with, with, uh, I'll start with some good intentions, and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Um, there, there, there are things that have happened, whether it's in our country or, or anywhere in the world, that, that are bad, right. that are ugly, that, that shouldn't be celebrated. And, and the, the obvious one that comes to mind in our country, of course, is, is slavery, and, and that, that was a horrible stain on our country. Right. And it's always going to be there, but the big thing is what do you do when you figure out as a, as a society – or as a majority of society, when you figure out, hey, this is wrong, mm -hmm. and we took care of that. It was it was ugly how it had to be taken care of, right. but it was taken care of. So back to back to the question, why do people want to erase history? That would be the the sort of noble reason. Hey, we don't like this, and we're not going to celebrate this. Well, not celebrating something doesn't mean we erase it. Right. And if you want to get into the maybe not so noble reasons for doing it. I'm sure there are probably people that it makes them feel good about themselves that they get to go out and hey, we're gonna we're gonna tear down some statues. <laughs> whether it's the need to feel good about oneself or whether it's going because your 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 friends are doing the same thing and we're gonna go and be part of the mob and right. going out and doing that doesn't solve anything. Absolutely not. I've been asked this question and it's an extreme example and I really don't like when this card is played in an argument because probably nine times out of ten when you hear it thrown out it's not really appropriate but the question's been asked to me well what if there was a statue of of hitler in your in your town square wouldn't you go tear it down and I, i've always said no i wouldn't go tear it down but i would be down at city hall saying what is this doing here right and how can we get rid of it <laughs> right and there's nothing wrong with that it's a reasonable position to take there are reasonable arguments to be made for removing some of the confederate things that are up there are reasonable arguments to be made for keeping them there, and I think that's something reasonable people can disagree on. The thing that you can't start doing is start just destroying things that you don't like because because they offend you or because you don't like them. And this gets into – I'm going to take this a little bit of a different direction for a second, but I think it ties in. This gets into cancel culture. This gets into how far do you go with taking things down where we don't like the – sins of the people who created them right and and you can you can ha you can discuss that with the founders of our country the founders of our country many of them had ugly sins mm -hmm. uh, some of them were slave owners and that's the, and there's nothing good about that but do we start discarding the works because of the sins of the authors because if we're going to go down that path at some point you're discarding literature you're discarding music you're discarding works of art you're discarding ideologies Right. And if you really want to go down the path of discarding things because of the sins of the authors, the if you take into the extreme, you're only, the only thing you're going to have left are the, the red letters and the four Gospels. Exactly. The irony of that, Jay, would be in a world that does everything they can do to remove God from the world. Once you cancel everything out, Jesus is the only thing left. That would be ironic, yes. And if I can go down the cancel culture rabbit hole for just a few seconds. That's that's a horrible thing. And and for people that aren't aware of what that term means, I'm sure a lot of people have heard it, but some people don't. Cancel culture is, I don't agree with you on such and such, John Thorne, so therefore I'm not going to talk to you. 
and in, in some ways it's acting like a bunch of bunch of 10 year olds on the playground who didn't get their way mm-hmm. but it's 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 evolved or i guess devolved would be the better word but it's it's progressed from that to john thorne i don't care for your views on such and such i'm not going to talk to you and nobody i know should talk to you because you're you're one of them you're you you don't see the world the way i see it right and when you start getting to the point of where you can't have discussions with people you disagree with, and then you can't have discussions with an intermediary with someone that you disagree with, how else are you going to resolve problems? Resolve problems? To them, you are the problem. We used to hear Iran say all the time, we're going to annihilate Israel off the face of the earth. Well, to me, not allowing a person to think and feel the way they think and feel is the same as Iran threatening to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Now people are saying, you don't deserve to exist because I don't agree with you. Yeah, and it's really a, it, and it's really a dangerous and, and, and ugly thing. I mean, it, it flies completely in the face of the, I adamantly disagree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Right. And, and that seems to be gone in some circles. When you have a society where religious political and intellectual pluralism cannot exist or does not exist or is struggling to exist, that's a problem. Right. And all that means is that when we have ideas that we disagree on, we can agree to disagree. We may not even we may not like each other. We may not decide to go get around together. <laughs> we may not decide to, to whatever, but we're gonna agree to disagree and not plot ways to shoot each other. Right. Well, to me, Jay, and I'll just say this and we'll move on. I won't even get into this because this is a whole nother show. But to me, the biggest problem was when politicians took spiritual issues and politicized them because it not only divided the country, it divided families, and it divided the church, which is just stupid. But let's move on. All right, so Jay, I know one of the things that you love to talk about are the forefathers. So give me some insight into the forefathers of our country. The Declaration of Independence, which was written in 1776, was written by a group of five men, but primarily by Thomas Jefferson, who was age 33 at the time. 33? 33. You get the feeling when you see these pictures of these guys that they were in their 50s and 60s. Everybody acts like they were old white curmudgeons. That's right. That's right. But he was he was 33 years old. And while some people will view the Declaration of Independence as a merely a historical document with a list of complaints against the king, of which a majority of it is that. It's far more than that. And I will say my favorite list in the complaints they had was he has erected a multitude of new offices (laughs) and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. Such a wonderful way of wording that and and, and kind of relevant in, in 2020 as well. But the, the Declaration of Independence is the foundation from which the Constitution comes from. The, the, the beginning of it where it says we held these truths to be self-evident. That is to say that we're not coming up with these rights right. and issuing them on behalf of the government. We're saying these rights exist. Yes. We're going to recognize that these rights, these natural or God-given rights exist. And and that was that was huge. That was as we would say that is groundbreaking, that is game-changing, whatever whatever phraseology you want for it. But but that was a that was a big deal to say that. Well, it was thrown down the gauntlet to say that th- these rights are bigger than government. Yes, it is saying that and it's saying that they don't come from government. It says we're going to establish government to protect these rights. We're not establishing government to give these rights, because if you're establishing government to give rights, well, then that same government can take them away. Okay, Jay, take us from the Declaration of Independence and walk us through how it coincides directly with the U.S. Constitution. The Declaration of Independence, I'm just going to read the text from the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government we've all heard that in in civics and history class but think about that what that's really saying it's saying these rights exist they already exist we're creating government not to grant them not to alter them but to secure these rights for everybody if you're going to create government to do this you have to have a foundation and a legal document to do that and that's what the constitution is yes 
the Constitution didn't come about until about 11 years later in 1787, over the summer in Philadelphia. And the Bill of Rights wasn't ratified until 1791, which are the first 10 amendments in the Constitution. <laughs> so, so for those that don't know, all of the documents that established our nation were not just thrown together and put on social media without any thought. It was actually a process. That is correct. It was, it was a process. It wasn't just thrown out there to, to, to quote the great John <laughs> Thorne. That's exactly right. It was a process, and it was not created in the sense of people having political party alliances, right? Because uh, that was something the founders actually, you know, strongly warned against. And it wasn't created so, hey, we're gonna we're gonna add this little part into the thing because this is gonna help our state or our group of people that we have together. They painstakingly went over each word and where where everything was was commas were placed, where where everything was put in there to make sure it was done right because this was gonna be the foundation of the country. And the amazing thing is, another youngster wrote. Well, it was written by a group of people as well, but the primary author was James Madison. Also, he was age 36. So that's just crazy incredibly young people for doing the stuff they did. These documents are over 230 years old and they're just as brilliant and relevant today as they were when they were written. To me, those documents are the foundation of the greatest country that God ever allowed to exist on planet Earth. That's right. Okay, Jay, let's segue out of the Constitution and let's get to some actual presidents. In your opinion, who are the top three presidents in U.S. history and why? Man, you're, you're throwing all kinds of – these are these are great questions. And, uh, again, these are, these are things that I think reasonable people can have different views on. Historians have had different views on them, of course. I think for the top three presidents, it's almost kind of like you've, yeah, you've got two already kind of cemented in there. Who's the third one? <laughs> Let me guess two of your three. Yes. You've obviously you're gonna go with Lincoln. You have to go with Lincoln, yes. And then I would say George Washington. You have to go with George Washington as well. And I think both reasons are self explanatory. No, they should be self explanatory, but they're not, unfortunately. Most people don't know history. Talk a little bit about Washington. George Washington was the first president. He was the right. the general who led the Revolutionary Army, who had the audacity to stand up to the British Empire. Yes. But he was also the president that after two terms said, I'm stepping down. King George inquired as to what George Washington was going to do now that he'd, he'd won the independence of the United States. And they said, they say he's going to go back to his farm. <laughs> and, and King George says if he does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world. I don't think most people take the time to think of how remarkable and brilliant that really was. That shows you that the forefathers were really thinking about protecting the people. Yes. Brilliant and remarkable on every level, but brilliant and remarkable. Think about the times that it was done. Right. You had monarchies. You didn't have a, you didn't have elected officials. You didn't have presidents who came and left. There was no model for it anywhere in the world. There really wasn't. And that's one of the there's a, there's a picture that uh, was taken in it was during Clinton's, I believe, his second term, and it was five former presidents in the Oval Office. It was Carter, Nixon, Reagan, Bush, and, and Clinton. And you look at it, and you're going, okay, it's a nice picture, all these guys. You know, they're different parties. That's not the part that's, that, that's, that's the amazing part of it. The amazing part of it is throughout history and in parts of the world even today, that picture couldn't exist because the reason that the next guy would have been in charge is because he took out the last guy. Exactly. And we don't do that here. No. Nope. Lots of other places in the world now don't do that, but we were one of the first places that that, that was that, that wasn't done 225 years ago. So for Washington to do that, that alone I think is 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 huge, not to mention the body of work of leading the United States in, in the Revolutionary War and, and gaining independence from Britain. So that's one. Yes. The second one you mentioned, Abraham Lincoln, and I'm not putting these in any order. There, you asked for, you asked for three, and I'm giving you three. Lincoln, Lincoln ended slavery, and he was willing to fight a war to do it. That's what, I, dude. When we talked the other night, and you threw that out, I was just that like hit me like an earthquake. He was willing to fight a war to end slavery, and that war was going to have one of three outcomes: the South was going to win, the North was going to win or the country was going to be divided. Right. Ideally, and, and what actually happened, of course, is the, the North won. The second choice would be we're going to split the country in two, and, of course, the worst-case scenario would have been the South winning. Right. But he was willing to do it, essentially saying this is so bad 
we can't do this. Right. We can't continue being party to this. Yes. Now, to me, you take everything you said about Lincoln and then add this thought to it, Jay. The simple fact that his stance on ending slavery and his willingness to fight that war to end it, the anger felt towards him was what led to him dying. That's right. And, and, and of course, he, that wasn't his goal. No, no one wants to be a, a martyr for anything, but, but it did. And, and he is still revered. I mean, he is revered by everyone, historians, just people in general across the political spectrum in this country 150 years later. Yes. And I believe around the world. Yes. Okay, so you gave me two. We've got Washington and we've got Lincoln. Who is your number three? Oh, man, there's been some good ones. There have been some bad ones. I'm going to pull a move and give a couple of answers for different reasons. I'm going to give one from my lifetime. I'm going to give one from, oh, say the 20th century, sort of, and then one from before anyone was around. If you go back to the time of the country's founding, I think you have to include, at least in the conversation, James Madison, the fourth president. Not necessarily for what he did as a president, but just the fact that he gave us the Constitution. I mean, that alone is pretty amazing. And then if you come into to the 20th century, uh, there's a couple choices. This one kind of makes me cringe in some ways because so much of the domestic policy was just awful. Some people will disagree with that, but FDR, when it came to foreign policy in World War II, right. spot on. <laughs> when it came to a lot of the domestic policy, not so much. I think it's important to look at past presidents and right. not go, well, this was bad, so this guy was no good. That's what we have going on in 2020 with so much, and, and, and that's not a good thing. So FDR is is one I think you, you, you put into the conversation in terms of foreign policy. And if you get into our lifetime, I think the conversation has to include Ronald Reagan with – you know, winning what essentially was World War III without firing a shot. Right. <laughs> and if, if you have to name, if I had to name one of those three, I would, I would go with Reagan. But there, there are reasonable arguments to be made for the other two, as well as, as well as multiple other people. There are reasonable. There are some presidents where there are no reasonable arguments to be made for them being great presidents. But <laughs> again, I think it's okay to to look at some of these 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 figures and go, this was great, this wasn't so great. Okay, Jay, give me an example of FDR and his domestic policy that ended up not being so great. FDR was part of the crowd that was in favor of an administrative state. And by that, I mean people that believed we needed to have bureaucracy and administrative law because things were taking too long to get through Congress. People in the general electorate weren't smart enough to know what was good for them. So we're going to we're going to appoint experts to tell them to take care of things for them. And, and that initially came from Woodrow Wilson, which Woodrow Wilson, I think, is one of the worst presidents we ever had uh, for, for that reason. But. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you one example from from FDR with how the how the Tenth Amendment was some would say gutted and some would say obliterated by a Supreme Court case that never should have never should have even come up. What in the 30s FDR had a series of policies called the New Deal, and you know, they were passed by Congress and 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 signed into law by by Roosevelt, and several of them were starting to get declared unconstitutional by by the court system. And he didn't care for that. So in 1937, at one of his fireside chats, he brought up the idea of – of, and, and this is something that's that's become relevant in the past couple months. He brought the up the idea – he didn't call it this at the time, but it was referred to as court packing. <laughs> when he was losing cases 7 to 2, 6 to 3, that kind of stuff, there's nothing that says the Supreme Court has to consist of nine justices. Right. I think I'm going to add six. So if you add six to that, you start winning those cases eight to seven or 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 nine to six, and that was kind of a looming uh, threat, maybe a strong word, but that's Jeez. what it was. It was a looming threat, and miraculously, about a month later, the Supreme Court started deciding cases in his favor. And one that comes up that is not really well known that that should be as well known as some of the most famous court cases that we all study in in basic civics classes. There was one in 1942 called Wickard v. Filburn, and I'll give you the, the, the quick version of it. 
Uh, Filburn was a, a guy called Roscoe Filburn. He was a, an Ohio farmer, and Claude Wickard was the Secretary of Agriculture. Now, this is the same Claude Wickard who brilliantly banned sliced bread in 1943. <laughs> you, you can't make this stuff up. But there was a there was a law passed, and it was a follow up to a previous law, but it was called the Agricultural Adjustment Act of of 1938. And what it did was issue quotas on how much of a commodity you could grow, and one of those commodities it addressed was wheat. They wanted to stabilize the price of wheat, so they wanted to reduce the amount of it. And just as a side note, we should all take notice whenever governments try to limit the amount of food that can be made, uh, it never really ends well. And, and, and you, can, you can look at instances of what the Soviets did in the Ukraine in the 30s or or China did with the the great leap forward in 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 59 to 60 and just you know millions and millions of people were were starved and killed for no reason. Anyway, back to Wickard v. Filburn. So, Filburn grew a quantity of wheat in excess of what he was allowed to to grow and he was fined and and refused to pay the fine. And the reason he refused to pay the fine was the Agricultural Adjustment Act was using the Commerce Clause. Like this is this is why we're doing this, which regulates interstate commerce. Well, Filburn said this is for private use. This this wheat that I'm being fined for is mine. I've never sold it. It's never left my property, and it could never have crossed state lines because it never left my property. Wow. He argued, you know, that there's no commercial activity of any kind. Um, they went to federal district court. Wick, Filburn won, and the government kept on appealing, and the case finally went before the Supreme Court. Right. Well, the government openly acknowledged in their argument that Filburn had neither engaged in commerce of any kind, nor had he moved anything across state lines, but argued by doing neither of those, he was engaging in interstate commerce. Oh, geez. <laughs> this is something that a high school debate team would pick apart. I mean, this argument is embarrassing. But with a looming threat of FDR to change the makeup of the court, the court sided unanimously with the government. Of course they did. This is going to make your head explode and make anybody's head explode if you read this. And it's not just a footnote and a laughable footnote. <laughs> of course. The ramifications <laughs> of this have been just huge. The court decided that had he not grown his own wheat, mm -hmm. he might have instead purchased some wheat on the open market. <laughs> If this is going to keep going for a second, oh, if he had purchased wheat on the open market, he might have purchased some wheat which had crossed state lines. He might have. And had others done the same in growing their own wheat and not engaging in commerce, much less interstate commerce, oh. the presumed cumulative effect of this hypothetical collective actions of inaction could have had an impact on wheat prices, some of which at some point could have crossed state lines. Oh my God, you're kidding me. So there are no less than half a dozen qualifiers to this absurd hypothetical the court used in justifying its ruling. And the ruling was growing a commodity on your own land with a commodity in question never leaves your property, is never sold, and never crosses state lines was decreed to be engaging in interstate commerce. <laughs> Dude, that is simply remarkable. Uh, this would be something laughable if the ramifications of this had just ended at, at Filburn's farm, but it, it, it didn't. And to this day, this ruling is what the federal government uses to justify legislating and regulating virtually every non-interstate, non-commercial activity, regardless of its substantial or, or non-existent impact on interstate commerce. And all of this was accomplished with a threat from a president, a farmer in Ohio, and 239 bushels of wheat, which never left his property. Oh my gosh, all because FDR threatened to pack the court. It really is, and it's just, it's a glaring example of just awful FDR. Wow, that is just nuts. On the other side of that, you've got the FDR that helped win World War II. So again, I think it gets back to it's okay to look at these figures and say, this was good, mm -hmm. this was awful. Nobody's perfect. That's right, nobody is perfect, and I'm going to go with Ronald Reagan as my number three. Right We've had some amazing people sit in that oval office yes we have i love reagan okay so you and i have traveled all over the world jay give me the three most important events in world history wow big ones big questions that's a bigger question than the last one <laughs> i think you have to start with the life of christ <laughs> i'll vote for that and whether or not you want to view that from a spiritual standpoint as a believer or whether you want to view that as a as a historian Changed everything. Yes, it did. Whether you want to view that from a position as a believer or a non-believer or uh, simply a historian, 
the life of Christ changed everything. I think that's the first one. The second one would be the the Magna Carta in 1215. You know, the, it, that's the foundation for individual rights. Uh, the third one, I think you you fast forward about 300 years and you got you got Martin Luther with the 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 95 Thesis and the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. That's quite a list, dude. Two of these three I've mentioned are obviously of of strong religious significance, but they were they were that impactful. I mean, the Reformation from a secular standpoint created the Protestant Catholic split. From a religious spiritual standpoint, it put forth the the notion that the individual could have a direct relationship, conversation, whatever word you want to use with God versus having to go through an intermediary in the church. That's awesome. Those are the three and if and if I'm gonna add a I'm gonna add a special fourth one. Uh, <laughs> the, the the fourth one the fourth Uh-oh. one I'm gonna add is is gonna be a culmination of those those three that wouldn't exist without those three. And, and the fourth one to me is the United States of America. Oh, dude, that's brilliant. Oh my gosh. Just the Magna Carta. Think about that. You know, it's a foundation for individual rights. And that's what the constitution and the declaration of independence talk about. They don't talk about collective rights. They don't talk about you as a group. You t- They talk about you as an individual. Right. And um, I'm always reminded there's a, there's a wonderful song on Phil Collins' record, uh, it's, the, the, it's the But Seriously record, which was his follow-up to No Jacket Required, both of which are brilliant records from the 80s. But there's a song on on But Seriously called Colors, and it's spelled with the proper British spelling, you know, O-U-R. But the song's about <laughs> apartheid, and, and the last – one of the last lines in one of the verses is these people each have a name. It's not just, oh, all those people, all those group of people. It's, no, these are all individuals. And that's that's so that's so important. That's such a distinction that has to be made. I think it's so important that we make a point to look at everybody else as individuals rather than assigning somebody to to teams, if you want to call it, if you want to use the word teams, based on based on a whole list of things that are asked on the census questionnaire, based on a whole list of things that are asked when people do exit polling at uh, election time. What's your religion? What's your gender? What's your What's your race? What's your sexual orientation? You know, all this, all this stuff. It's... <laughs> right. Hey, I want to ask you real quick. What is your opinion of identity politics, that new wave of uh, the way the world sees each other? Identity politics is one of the more disgusting things that we've we've done in the past 30 or 40 years where you, 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 you try to go and find people to get stirred up against other people simply based on that they're part of something different than each other. And that's just, that's, that's foul. That's, that's, that's awful. Right. It never ever leads to anything good. Is the purpose of this to edify and unite? Right. And I don't mean unite in a kumbaya, oh, we should all be together. Well, some <laughs> things we're not going to agree on, right. but is the purpose of this to, to edify uh-huh. and to make better, or is the purpose of this to find ways to sow more discord amongst people? Right. And the last thing I think people need is more discord. If the goal is chaos versus, hey, the goal is this is wrong. This is how we want to fix this. And and along the way, there's some chaos. Well, that's going to happen. But if the goal is simply chaos for the sake of chaos, there, there's nothing good that comes of that. Yeah, but what if everybody's wrong but me, Jay? Whether someone has a D or an R after the name shouldn't shouldn't be the determining factor of what they said was right or wrong. If what they said was right, then it's right. If what they said was wrong, then it's wrong. Exactly. <laughs> and this gets back to what we talked about with the founders. They didn't write these amendments to the Constitution. They didn't write the Constitution so they could make sure they're looking out for their their crew or their team or their type or whatever that was. They wrote this stuff because they, they thought it was the right way to do things. And when there were ideas – from people that they adamantly disagreed with on major topics, but the ideas they put forth on something else were good, they embraced them. And that's what we're supposed to do, not disagree with them because, oh, well, the person who said that is is of the other party or of whatever, and, I, and I'm supposed to have a problem with it. That, that's, that's absurd. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, Jay, 30 seconds. I need you to tell everyone in the United States that gets to vote on Tuesday, tell them why they should go vote. Oh, I could be sarcastic and say I guess it depends on who you're voting for, but I'm not going to go there. It's important to vote because I'll just start with one. There are 190-plus countries around the world, and there are more than a few where you don't get to vote. There are more than a few where you don't get to speak your mind, and and we have both of those rights in this country, not because we were given them but because those rights exist for all people in all times. We just happen to have them here. I can't imagine not voting. I can't say this for certain, 
but I can't think of an election since I turned 18 where I haven't voted. Right on, dude. That is fantastic. Go vote next Tuesday. Go vote. Uh, we're going to move on from politics now, but for those that live outside the United States, I, uh, I want to apologize for the heavy political talk today. Um, it won't be like this any other time, but with the election coming up next Tuesday, wanted to get Jay's thoughts on all of this stuff. So I'm going to jump in real quick on that. Go ahead. I don't necessarily think that this has been political in the sense of left-right stuff or exclusively American. I know we've talked about a lot of American history stuff, but so many of the themes we've talked about are not just relevant in America. They're relevant around the world. That's right. Well said, dude. Okay, so let's get to what you're doing now. You're like me. You will reinvent yourself every chance you get. With all my time in the music industry, I've still managed to keep one foot in that sandbox as I've got a company where I archive recording projects for record labels, which means I'm preserving intellectual property. It's, uh, it's what I call my day job, and it's fun, and I get to work with great people. But about 10 years ago, I started coaching soccer at a school in Nashville called Christ Presbyterian Academy. It's a K-12, to and I help out. I'm the goalkeeper coach for the boys' and girls' high school teams. In 2010, our girls' team was one of the best teams in the state, and I made a short movie and documented our season, and and we graduated, I think, eight starters that year. We didn't win the thing. We we just it, it didn't work out. And the next year, I said, well, we're going to be kind of down this year. This will be a rebuilding year, as they say. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a camera and make a book and document our season because we're not going to have a good season. Well, we ended up actually making the state championship. We lost in the final, but we, we had a wonderful season. But I bought this Canon Rebel T3i, and it came with these two plastic lenses, the little cheap ones that come in the – you get it at Sam's Club or Costco. It's the one that's got all this stuff in one box for like 600 bucks. And I knew if I ever got good at this, I'd need better gear, but I didn't want to go spend a bunch of money because it didn't make sense. And, and I've always said you buy better gear when you've outgrown what you have. And that means you're getting good results, but your gear is holding you back versus you're getting lousy results and you want to blame the gear. Oh, it must be the golf clubs. Or that's why I'm not shooting. No, you're just not a good golfer. <laughs> but I bought a camera and documented the season, and I've, I've still got the book sitting here. And I said, I need to get a better lens. So I bought a better lens. And then a couple of months after that, I need to get a better camera. And it just started progressing. I still wasn't making any money off of this. It wasn't <laughs> even something that it crossed my mind to, to do. It was just something that was fun. Right. But there's so much great information out there on YouTube and, and a couple of places you can go in, whether you, whether you pay for a subscription or just go to B&H or Adorama, all, all the companies that sell this stuff. So I watched a video one day. I go, okay, that's how I, I want to try this. So I bought a couple of strobes, and and I think that was about 2013, and and started using using flashes, and from then it it progressed into where I was doing all this stuff for the the athletic department, where you're 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 taking images of of student athletes, not just competing in games, but doing promotional type pieces, like the kind of stuff you would see in uh, commercial advertising. Dude, all your pictures, all your posters and stuff you've done of those kids, they all look like stinking Nike ads. Well, thank you. That's that's very kind. And, and But that's also the goal. The, the goal has never been to, hey, let's look better than the, the next high school up the street. And that's not to slight anybody else's work. But I've never had that as a goal. The goal has always been, okay, what's the best stuff out there? The best stuff out there is the NFL or Nike or Under Armour or, or whoever's putting out all this stuff with all these great creatives. And that's always been the the bar I've tried to to reach. And sometimes we hit it, and sometimes we we miss. But you always want to aim for the good stuff. Right. So a couple of years later, I think it would have been around 2015, I get a call from someone at the athletic department at at Belmont University, which is a D1 school here in Nashville, and they wanted to meet with me about doing some work for them. So I started doing their their athletic media days, and we we they had, they had 15 teams on campus. And then Lipscomb University down the street hired me away from them. And I've been with Lipscomb now for about five, I think, I guess about four years now. It's not a full-time job, but it's a client that I have. And one of my other clients that I have is Nashville Soccer Club, which is our MLS team. And I'm one of the team photographers for them. That's awesome, dude. But my main gig with this is still Christ Presbyterian Academy, where I started. 
but that role has changed and has expanded. It's gone from just, okay, we're taking some pictures of student athletes and some games, and it's progressed to they're a very forward-thinking athletic department administration up there, and they understand the role of athletics, how it's not shouldn't be the primary focus, but it's a big curb appeal thing. Right on. And part of that is not just, okay, here's some pictures from the game we won last night. That's great. But the next level beyond that is 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 telling a story, telling telling what's going on, giving people some insight into what we're trying to do, and then I think the third level is something that I, I stole this line from from you too. They talk about when you play an arena, it's different than when you play a theater, and an arena is also different than when you play a stadium. Right. And when you're playing in those bigger venues, you have to find a way as an artist to shrink the venue, as they say, and by that it means. You get the guy in the back in the in the 300 deck, <laughs> and somehow you make him feel like he's in the front row. And I think with social media, that's so important just beyond, as I said, giving scores and posting pictures and even telling stories. You try to shrink right. the venue. You try to let people into situations and areas where they couldn't get to, whether that's a, a fan of the program or whether that's a family and a parent, which is a lot of what that is. You get, I get access to the, the teams that the parents wouldn't get access to. And even if the parent did have access, maybe their kid wouldn't do things with their dad standing next to him like there. When we've made a point to not just promote what colleges call the revenue sports, which would be men's and women's basketball and football, we're promoting everything. Our, our smallest team on campus is the women's golf team, the girls' golf team, and we have four members of the team, so that's the smallest team. We go out and cover golf, and we make sure we cover boys' and girls' events equally, not because we've got some Title IX mandate. We don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. We cover boys' and girls' events equally because right. the student-athletes that are doing that, are, are, regardless of gender, are just as passionate about what they're doing as the football team is. Well, this school is not your typical high school. This is like the best of the best. This is a crazy great high school. It is. It is a great school, and they've got great people. They've got great people running it. They've got great people working there. They've got great families, and that's one of the, 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 the most fun things about the job is you get to capture images. You get to capture moments, but getting to share the stuff with those people and their families. Right. That's awesome, Jay. What's one of your favorite memories? What's one of your favorite pictures you've shot? And one of my favorite images I've taken there in the past couple of years was an image from the boys basketball state quarterfinal in 2019. So it's been about a year and a half. And we're down by two, and our top player has had to leave the game because he, he turned his ankle and he's he's out for the game. He, he, he had to leave with about three or four minutes left. So we're down by two with about 10 seconds left, and – our head coach is a guy called Drew Maddox. He played Vanderbilt. He played back. The head coach is a guy called Drew Maddox, brilliant basketball mind, played at Vanderbilt in the SEC. And he's actually written a book. He's an inspirational speaker and all kinds of stuff. Great guy. But he didn't take the time out because he knew if we did, the matchup might not work because we couldn't catch them off guard. So he just goes for it. They inbound the ball. They bring it up. And our point yard drives to the basket. He's about – two feet from the basket. He's got three defenders that have converged on him. He kicks it out to another player at the three point line in the corner and he's wide open and he's got about an hour to throw this, throw this to throw this shot to win the game with, 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 for a buzzer beater and puts it up and it goes in and we win the game. And it's just this incredible moment. And we, we go into the state semifinals, but the, the image I got was you can see all 10 players in the frame and they're all looking up because because one team's up by two, and a three-pointer's in the air, and the clock's about to expire. And the frame I got, the ball is in the net, just hanging in there. And of course, it, it goes through, and, and it wins, but it, it's already through. But all ten players are looking up with that look on their face of, is it my season that's over? Because they know somebody's season's going to be over right then, because someone's going to win or lose it. And uh, it's such a wonderful image, and, you, and the, the gym was packed. And you can look, you, and everybody in the crowd's got the same look on their face. With, is this going to go in or not? My goodness, <laughs> that's awesome, dude. Those kids will have that image for the rest of their life. I'll just tell you one more because I can. <laughs> in 2018, our girls' <laughs> soccer team uh, was in the state championship, and we're actually in the final four this week as well. Uh, two years later, uh, it was a great program uh, run by a guy called Tom Gerlock. He's a good personal friend of mine and, and a great soccer mind as well. 
and he loves the social media stuff. He's really, he, he loves the images I do. And, and, and it's really great to have coaches like, like Tom and Drew that absolutely embrace this and get that this is how we promote our student athletes, and promote what we're doing. But back to the state championship in 2018 with my girls team, it goes through regulation zero, zero. We go through the overtimes zero, zero. It goes to a shootout. So I go back behind the goal in one of the corners and from a photographer's standpoint, it's just low hanging fruit. They're all lined up at midfield. <laughs> you know, when your team wins, they're going to awesome. jump up and run down and, and greet the, either the goalkeeper who made the save or the, the girl that scored the winning goal. So we get to the sixth round and it, 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 shootouts go five rounds. And from there on, it's almost like extra innings in baseball. If I score and you don't, well, it's over. So, so we scored the top of the six nice. and the other team comes down and, and our, our goalkeeper makes the save and, and we win. And as soon as the whistle was blown for the girl to take, to take the shot, I just started letting it rip and it was brrr, just taken not of, and not of the shooter or the goalkeeper, but of the girls at midfield. Right. Because you knew you were going to get the emotion yep. and just got this amazing series of pictures from that and then of course the mob at the end where they jump on the girl and it's the, it's the <laughs> dog pile at the end where everybody's just celebrating and right. emotional and crying and everything under the sun and, and it's and I did the whole series in black and white because partially because it was gross the stadium light wasn't great at night but the emotional stuff like that is so much more powerful in black and white right. that that image I talked about with the basketball that's a black and white one I've put out as well that's cool and and it's funny, after the game, I had a couple of the parents come to me, Jay, did you get a picture of the winning save? I said, I didn't even see it. <laughs> and they go, well, what do you mean? Why, why, why didn't you see it? Why didn't you take a picture of that? And they weren't they weren't mad. They were just asking. And I said, because there's no context. It, it said it's a girl catching a ball. <laughs> you, you don't get the shooter. You don't get the, It'd be one thing if it was a remote behind the goal or some kind of thing, but it was just, it'd be a girl catching a ball. I said, I, I didn't get that, but I got this. <laughs> It's one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken, and you show them this, and they just kind of just go, oh, my. How cool for those kids, dude. So all I'll just say is getting to do that is great, but getting to do that for people that you know, families that you know. I mean I've got kids that I've known – that I've known families there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I've got kids that still – well, they're not kids anymore. <laughs> I've got kids that are now adults that – that you still keep up with in your text. Right. I've got people that invite you to weddings. That's that's so wild. That is awesome, Jay. I'm so glad those kids have you to capture all those memories, all those moments. That's uh, very cool that you do that. Well, thank you. And 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 I and I try, and I hope that reflects because because right. that's why I do it. Like I said, it's awesome getting to capture this stuff. It, it'd be awesome. It'd be fun to shoot a Super Bowl. <laughs> but I'd be just as excited. In fact, I'd probably. Be, I will be more excited this Friday night if, if we if we win Thursday we're, we're Thursday's the semifinal. Mm -hmm. If we win Thursday we're we're in the state championship. I would be more excited to shoot that than to shoot a World Cup match because that's awesome. Dude. And not that I wouldn't want to shoot a World Cup match, but it but it's different. It's people you know. It's people you're invested in. It's people that you believe in what they're doing as as individuals and as families and and as an institution. It's it's amazing getting to do that. And I love getting to do it where I do it at CPA. Well, Jay, that's the perfect place for us to wrap up episode one with you, buddy. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this. This has been remarkable. God bless America. God bless you, Jay. I love you, dude. Well, Thorne, thank you for having me. I have enjoyed this a lot. This has been, this has really been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed discussing this stuff. I always enjoy discussing this stuff, but I've enjoyed discussing this stuff with you. The questions you've asked have been great. And I hope the people listening to this have, have enjoyed it and have been able to get something out of it. Absolutely. Dude, it's been great. I really appreciate it. I will buy you lunch next time I see you. That sounds like a deal. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services for your church to generate more interest, create more exposure, and reach more people. Let Hey, Rockstar amplify the awesomeness of your ministry. And, as always... Hey, Rockstar is a proud sponsor of the Stage Right with John Thorne podcast. My special thanks to Jay Wilkinson for joining me today. Thanks for listening, and my thanks to Hey, Rockstar for sponsoring. Have a fantastic week, and don't forget next week, Kirk Sullivan from For Him.